And now, please welcome Skift Senior Research Analyst, Seth Borgo, and Skift Founder and CEO, Rafid Ali. Yeah. Um, thank you, folks. Thank you. This is our last. We're, we're 10, 15 minutes away from drink, so uh, just bear with us. Uh, I just want to say that it's Sean's sixth anniversary with Skift, and I, if you've been with Skift for, uh, if you've read Skift for any length of time, you, you, you know Sean's important to Skift, so I just want to give him a quick hand. Here. Yeah. Um, it's actually his anniversary today, so I just wanted to give a shout out to him. He's just been great. Anybody who's ever talked to him or has been on the other side of an interview, he's always a fair but tough interviewer, as Johannes just saw. <laughs> and so, anyway, so this is our last session. This is sort of a, a more um, blue sky thing that we're, we're, we're going to do. Uh, Seth's going to uh, run through some, um, some slides that we're going to talk a little bit long range on what I talked early on about demographic flows in travel and uh, in the world and what that means for the travel industry. So um, I guess yeah, answer. totally. We're going to have kind of interesting, kind of fun session. We're going to talk about this concept of like a demographic dividend. If this is mega trends, we're going like uber trends. And I'm obviously up here with my boss's boss. So you know, if, if, even if you don't like the session, tell us you liked it a lot, right? Please. <laughs> so one of our mega trends was this idea of you know India comes of age. India becomes the new China, and uh, well. Our founder and CEO, yes. Rafit, tweeted out this whole idea about what's happening in India. And so we've got him on stage to talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, right? this weekend, or maybe it was last week sometime, I, I, I forget how I came across this, how, whatever the, the rabbit hole I was going down um, on one of the weekends while kids were running around, <laughs> was uh, I read that India was going to overtake China uh, sometime in April this year is the most populous nation. And coming from India and having read about this for years, for some reason, in my mind, this was 15 years in the future. I think all of one of the first reactions was, wow, this, this happened this quickly. Uh, and um, and, and what, what happened was the China's uh, population fell off a cliff in the last 10 years, dramatically. And so what was going to happen much, much later in the 30s and the 40s, 20s, 30s and 40s, got pulled into the 20s. So uh, the estimates are that, that India's population is going to overtake China. So I tweeted this uh, and then a few other uh, tweets after on um, some of the particulars of what's happening in India and uh, some of the charts that we're going to talk. And it became, vi like I guess, industry viral. I'm not going to say viral because, like, you know, but industry viral. and. Um, and I fig and there's so many implications for what this means for the travel industry. So we're going to talk about it. Yeah, and I think when I look at this chart too, what stands out to me is not just that India is surpassing China, but look where they're going to peak, right? Like China's population is actually going to start to decline. India's is going to grow for the next 20 or 30 years, and it's going to change really the face of what outbound tourism looks like. I mean, it's just so such. Or the mass outbound tourism looks. The like. mass outbound tourism. You know, this is from our, actually, this is a graphic from the mega trend that it's live right now. Um, you know, so we're expecting a full recovery, nearly 27 million outbound travelers. Could it be 29 million in a couple of years? And, and even these destinations that are traditionally the kind of the neighbor of China, right? Like Thailand is right by China. It's where it gets a huge amount of outbound Chinese traffic. We talked with the, you know, Skiff talked with these. Thailand tourism minister saying we're really interested in Chinese outbound tourists too. Like we're maybe seeing a million visitors from India in the next couple of years, so it's it's really changing. I think the game for for it, and, and it's a totally maybe you can talk to us about it, a totally different maybe culture in travel and what that means if Indian travelers happen more. And, and I'll show this chart really fast too. I think tells an important thing. I've got a couple of these. They're called population pyramids. So it's a way that a demographer would look at the population. Each of those numbers is ages. So we're looking at age buckets. And then we're just looking at what percent of the population is in each age. And so this is China versus India. What you'll notice is there's the, the 45 to 55 gap boom in, in China. And then there's that millennial 25 to 35 gap in China. But in the next 20 years, China's going to get a lot older. And if you look at the Indian pyramid, it tells a very different story. It's a very young nation, 
And they're going through their baby boom as we speak today, whereas China's kind of halfway through it right now. So it's a really interesting dynamic happening here. Yeah, and the fascinating thing is, and um, I don't know if you have charts. I think we have charts ahead in, in this as well. And the, the, the young Chinese population versus the young Indian population, um, for those, uh, you may have connections to India. Some of you are probably watching online have connections to India. The young, uh, the young Indian, and this is a very general statement, are just so much more global than uh, certainly when I was growing up there uh, back in India. Can we get that chart back up here? Um, yeah. Because I was looking at this chart, um, Brian, on this monitor. You can always just check. I up, guess up I can look the at top that. There or something. But um, the, uh, the 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 young uh, Indian population is so much more global. Like if I talk to my younger cousins or uh, nephews and nieces in India, uh, they know more about the Netflix shows than, than we do here in New York. This is 100% this, this is true. Uh, and uh, they know so much more about um, so many other, other things in the world. Like my cousin, uh, this is a true story. Three years ago, right before COVID, my cousin uh, was coming to U.S. for the first time. My aunt called me and says, this is the first time he's coming. He's a, uh, uh, can you please take care of him? Can you go to the airport? He lands at the airport and says, this is the airport in the US? <laughs> this is JFK. And I said, well, this is our airport. And then, um, and then I said, you have, to, uh, you have to go here, you have to go here. This is what you have to do. He said, I have it. I have Google Maps. I can put whatever I want to go. It'll tell me where to go. That's it. He didn't need any instructions from me. So the point is, they're so much more global and mobile. Uh, compared to when we were growing up. And then in terms of, you know, we, when you talk about the travel industry, travel industry had to have a China strategy, meaning how do, we, um, how, how do our hotels become China friendly? How do our destinations become more China friendly? With Indian travelers, it's less, it's just so much more global. So the point is that, uh, so that's certainly a point, which is um, with the population that they have, the people who have money, and I was talking to Hari, um, because both of us are Indian, um, uh, the people who have money have so much more money. The disposable income in India for the for the for the for the people who are rich is just so much more, at a whole different level. And so when they will travel, they'll spend a lot of money. And uh, so I think that's the one. Well, and, continue. And, yeah, and, and one other thing point you made to me is is it's an English speaking nation too, right? Like, at the at the level that that is going to travel globally, correct? Yeah. So. We're talking about India versus China here and, and the reordering of Asian traveler. I do want to say, we're not just here to say China's over. China is so hugely important. And the reason for that is also not just because of the numbers of travelers and because they're traveling today, not in the next 10 years, but also because of the per capita spend, which we shouldn't forget. And th this is a, a, an important point. So this is a slide we put together. Average expenditure per outbound trip. You, the black bars are different broad regions, and then the yellow bars are the two important countries we're comparing here, which is China and India. And so China still spends, I mean, almost $1,700 per outbound trip. That's more than in America. Like, that is a huge amount of spending. So China's not going to disappear overnight. And even if there are potentially more Indian tourists, the key is if there's 10% more Indian tourists, but they spend a third of what, two thirds of what a Chinese traveler does, China's still very much going to matter. The flip side of that is that there's a huge opportunity for catch up. Because what if that Indian number could get to the 1600 figure? That's, that's billions of dollars. And by the way, let's look in the far right side of this chart, Latin America and Africa, which are by far the smallest. What if they could catch up and get to even an, a, a, a $500 per outbound spend? So there's a lot of potential for catch up here across the world. Both we got to consider the, the absolute number of travelers, and then you got to consider how much purchasing power and spend they have. And th this, also, let's remember that in many of these nations, international travel is very much a luxury, which is sort of what you were talking about, Rafit. And again, this is a, a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Part of the reason why Chinese travelers have so much spend per capita is look at this outbound trips per population. It's only 11% of the population that's taking trips. So it's the very wealthiest 10%. And they've got plenty and plenty of cash to spend. In India, it's 2% population penetration. So we're looking at very slim amounts of the population. As a result, they tend to be the wealthier and more luxurious part of the population. But also, as we're thinking out you know, 20, 30, 50 years from now, if that Indian number went from 2% to 10% of the Indian population, it's, I mean, hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of travelers. Travelers, yeah. And the interesting part is, like, for instance, Middle East, and this is particularly true of um, 
a place like Dubai, they've figured out why Indians matter in terms of the volume. And uh, all these new um, investments that are going in, I mentioned earlier uh, in my intro, whether it's Saudi, et cetera, the numbers that they're talking about that they need to reach, 2030 vision, whatever vision you want to call it, um, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, where are, they going to come, where are they going to come from? Certainly not going to come from the West. They just don't have the numbers. There's a very interesting um, series that the New York Times is running that we were talking about last yeah. night called Aging Asia. If you Google um, or go on the New York Times website, maybe you'll find it. But it's profiles of um, Japan, China, South Korea, et cetera, and what's happening culturally in those countries, um, particularly particularly um, Japan. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so what it means for outbound from those countries long term I think it's pretty obvious what's going to happen. Yeah, and I, I think this is as good a point as anywhere to kind of pause that there's not a slide to go with it. But the flip side of if there's millions of young people coming from India, from China, or from other emerging markets, which we'll talk a little bit more about, what's happening in the developed markets? And the reality is they're very much graying and getting older. And so the flip side of where are there are hundreds of millions of young people coming from, there's going to be hundreds of millions of older people in Japan, in Europe, in the US, and that's going to also, so you've got these kind of two forces where on the one hand, where is the next baby boom coming? It's not the West, but we're here in New York, so maybe we need to start thinking about you know, travel for an older or more grayer demographic. Demographic, yeah. We, um, we as Skift have, have talked about, uh, we, we had a bunch of speakers in some of our previous conferences, and we talk a lot about disability and travel. And, uh, and the reality is we are all future disabled travelers. At some point, we will all need something. And so it's not a, it's not a small part of the market. It is the market. Long term, certainly, that's the market. If these Western populations and Eastern, some of the Eastern ones are graying, the industry has to adapt to adding more accessibility. And it's not an option. This is the market. And it's going to be increasingly being the market. It's a bit of a tangent from what we're talking about, but this is the other end of it. I think it's the corollary. It's like the inverse of if there's this young population here, there's going to be an older population here. And by the way, here's where we're going to go really, really mega, mega, mega trend to looking out to 2100. Where does the growth in the population come from? Well, we're talking Asia, right, India and China. That's out till 2050. Where is it coming from until 2100? It's actually Africa. And so you're saying... You know, China is becoming a more mature market. India is becoming the new China. Well, who's becoming the new India, so to speak? And it's this whole generation of new emerging markets. They're still very much, well, actually, they're increasingly represented in travel. That's what this slide speaks to. But the reality is, if you compare where the developing world is in terms of population, in terms of economics, and then you compare where they are in terms of international travel, there's a big mismatch there. And especially as you look out over 10, 15, 20, 30 years, there's a, a very, very big uh, mismatch between where the, the future of travelers is coming from. And to give you a really extreme example, and this is, this is long-term thinking, folks, but you know, we were looking at those population pyramids earlier. You thought that India had a young population. What do you think of this one? This is an incredibly young population, and it's 200 million people, again, primarily English-speaking, um, coming from a, a, the real in-the-wings kind of developing nations. And I think this was the other stat. Like, If you look at projection of population, more than half of all population increase is going to come from eight countries. Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Philippines, and Tanzania. And so I'm not saying you need to go home tomorrow and come up with your Tanzania strategy, but I... <laughs> well, I Congo strategy. Yeah, yeah. well, the Congo... You know, there's, there's a lot needed for, for, to pair the population boom with the needed economic boom. But, and I'll just skip ahead, this is, this is a, an, a, a PwC study. We really, if you were really thinking in the long, long term, we can't ignore, you know, you, you guys are tasked, what were you talking, a subtitle for this conversation, be like, where are you going to find the next 100 no, million No, 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 you're sanitizing it. I'm where the fuck are you going to find all these people that you want <laughs> to come to your destination? We're not, but I that, can say. That was, that was the technical. Uh, <laughs> where, where are you going to find them? You know, if we're really thinking big picture, big mega trends here, I think this is a lot of, of what you should be thinking about. And, and the key really is that, this, this is a slide I've, I've made and I've showed a couple of times. We're looking at 
tourism expenditure per capita on the y-axis, and we're looking at GDP per capita on the x-axis. And it's a very strong relationship. If you get wealthier, you travel more. And that is true. Doesn't matter your, your race, your religion, your culture, where you come from. You want to, you start domestic, then it goes regional, then it goes international. It starts with visiting friends, friends and relatives, but then people are curious about the world everywhere they are. It's, it's a, almost a universal trait. There's business connections, there's imports, there's exports. Travel is really one of these really fundamental ways of, ex of expressing ourselves. And, you know, we've done some work. I think it's like 20,000 GDP per capita is really the point where you're no longer so focused on, like, where's the next, you know, whatever, you know, surviving. And you can really start to think about building international businesses and, and about leisure. But if, you, if the world gets wealthier, which it, we hope it will, we believe it will, and it kind of must, then we're in the right industry for the long, long, long term. And we got to be thinking about these long-term trends and what they mean for our industry. That's it, right? Well, you got any thoughts? I, uh, I have one more closing thought. Well, but. I mean, the good news is that Skift is focused on travel. I, I wish we were, uh, you know, I'm glad we're focused on the travel industry and not anything else, because yeah. travel, travel is the mega trend. OK, uh, I guess, do we Want to answer some, some questions? I've I got one more thought. OK, go ahead. Well, no, no, the, the last thought was about you're bringing it back to what you were saying, Rafa, about creativity, about this could be travel's most creative year. And you had all those, those reasons. I think for just to this era, like, you know, Chesky talks about there's a revolution happening in travel. And yeah. I get it. He has to say that. But, um, <laughs> but I think from, a, from just the possibility, what, what, what we wanted to get across to, um, to you and, and people watching online was uh, if the industry wants it to be, this could be one of the most creative phases of travel going ahead for all the reasons we talked about for the last three hours. And, um, and that's really what this uh, last 15 minutes is. If you, if you are um, more open to what's happening demographically in the world, then you'll think more big picture of what your strategies need to be. 15, 20 years ago, you probably got tasked with coming up with a China strategy. Uh, and now you should be thinking about an India strategy for many different reasons. And we can continue talking about why that's important. But, uh, or, or how to do that. But, um, but that's why we wanted to plant some seeds on why we think this is the most creative phase of travel post-pandemic for all the pains all of us went through. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's just, we've talked about the mega trends for 2023, 2024, the tactical creativity, and then the long-term creativity of what all these hundreds of millions of people are going to bring to our industry. And we wanted to end on this very positive and, and kind of upbeat note upbeat. that we're excited that it's an incredible industry and that long term, both US, Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, there's a huge amount of potential for creativity and for new ideas and a need for new ideas in our travel industry. All these questions are political. I'm going to pass on all of them. <laughs> um, China versus India. Thank you very much. Um, what do we have to do? Thank, thank the people? Yeah, give us some closing thoughts. <laughs> closing thanks. OK. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I want to thank. Um, Uh, I want to thank our team that worked very hard. We start the work on megatrends sometime in the summer. I know it kind of sounds nuts. We, we, we start like six months before just collecting thoughts. And then a global forum, which is a conference that many of you have come to, whatever the speakers talk about on stage, we start taking uh, threads from there and then start forming a list of mega trends that end up then coming on stage uh, as we as we launched it today. So uh, it's a, it's a long range work that we do. So thank you all. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to all the sponsors. And uh, and then um, we have drinks. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, the the mega trends are launched. If you want to uh, download the full magazine, uh, it's a it's a online package as well as a downloadable package. I think is it a downloadable package this year? I don't. It is okay. Um, it's not? Okay, no. You can just read it online or on your phone if you want to. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, people watching online.